therefore pleased to welcome Professor Thomas Hoy uh, here from the University of Minnesota. He earned his PhD in uh, 1976 at Harvard University, working in the laboratory of uh, Professor Robert Woodward. That fall, he joined the faculty here at Minnesota, where he has had uh, a long career and has enjoyed many honors. Uh, the most recently, uh, he was named the College of Science and Engineering Distinguished Professor. Uh, his teaching interests uh, span synthetic and mechanistic or organic chemistry, and he has mentored 82 students who have completed their PhD research under his guidance. Professor Hoy's research interests are broad, and they include advancing new synthetic methods, natural product structure determination, sustainable polymers from renewable resources, and the design of functional nanoparticles for drug delivery. Today, Professor Hoy will present a talk on drug-loaded block copolymer nanoparticles. Please welcome Tom Hay. Thank you, Jim. I sent that to you uh, two days ago, but it already needs to be updated since uh, another student defended his thesis this morning successfully. So I guess it's 83, right? <laughs> um, OK. Pro-drug-loaded block, co uh, block copolymer nanoparticles using chemistry to control both the cargo and the packaging. Now, that's not very specific. So let me uh, point out that I could have called this a nanoparticle-based drug delivery strategy enabled by flash nanoprecipitation. We'll talk about that, FNP. That's the technique we use to make particles. A novel silicate ester prodrugs. That's the cargo. And P PEG PLGA. That's the packaging we'll be talking about principally uh, here in the, in the presentation. So my research group brings the... I'd call it the perspectives, the limitations, the biases, and the opportunities of a small molecule chemist to the drug discovery arena. And what I mean by the drug discovery arena, I think many have seen this kind of a pyramid. Uh, we have a view from the bottom. That is, we're the folks who begin fueling the engine. Um, and the closest thing I could find to a pyramid is on its side, but you get the point. Many of you seen, have seen the content, the, the implications of this kind of timeline. 10,000 compounds for every uh, roughly, roughly that, that lead to, on average, that lead to every uh, final approved drug. And the losses along the way as one gets in, uh, moves out of the realm of the medicinal chemist and the organic chemist into preclinical development, more medicinal chemistry there. Toxicologists come into play, and then, of course, on into clinical trials where the medical field uh, takes over its expertise uh, in, in, in furthering uh, the final development. Long time frame. Uh, the view from the bottom, because we spend much of our time uh, down in this arena. If I put that in the, form, in the form of chemical structures, here's the kind of things that we do and think about. We have the luxury of thinking about discrete samples for most of the time. A pure component of just one molecule, many copies of, of it, whereas in the world of polymer chemistry and, uh, uh, and, and the like, uh, one often is working with ensembles of, of, of similar molecules. But this makes life a little bit easier, but challenging in terms of the total synthesis of complex molecules that we've worked on over the years. Uh, we look at uh, individual reactivity patterns of, of some novel chemistry in the last half dozen years that we call a hexadehydrodiels alder reaction. Uh, we've been involved in natural product structure elucidation, including pheromones of sea lamprey, for example. Uh, we are fond of developing nuclear magnetic resonance methods with the spectro spectroscopic techniques that we, uh, uh, that, that we like to uh, spend time thinking about and contributing to. And we also do polymer synthesis and drug delivery, and that's the emphasis of what I'm going to, uh, going to talk about today. But I wanted to give you this background to sort of give you a sense of where we're coming from, if you will. If you're looking for a problem, in, if you're involved in a problem in nanomedicine and in, in research, uh, chances are you're going to need some of this kind of expertise on the front end. If you don't have it yourself, go find a collaborator. Go find an organic chemist. That person probably can contribute in, the, in, in helpful ways. Be prepared, however, to teach that person the myriad things that we're ignorant of and all the rest of what has to go on in terms of nanomedicine, because that's what collaborations are for, is bringing together people that have overlapping expertises that can complement one another. Using chemistry to control the cargo and the packaging. So we bring these same perspectives, limitations, bias, and opportunities to nanomedicine, I would argue. But it takes a team, as I just said. And the first incarnation of that team, going back half a dozen or more years ago, was with my long-term collaborator, Chris McCosco, uh, now retired and shutting down his laboratory, but in the, the Department of Chemical Engineering and Material Science, a polymer physicist, if you will. 
Uh, also, Alan McCormick, some for some microscopic help, uh, microscopy help there. But also now uh, uh, continuing the, the Panyan lab, the, the lab of Professor Jant Panyan, the head of pharmaceutics. And there's Jant, and this is the original set of students that uh, pioneered uh, the work and did much of the work that I'm going to share with you today. But I'll give you a sense of where we are in terms of current generations going forward. Um, a series of papers that have emerged from that collaborative work over the years. Nanoparticles containing high loads of paclitaxel, that's the drug we'll principally be talking about, silicate prodrugs, their formulation, drug release, and anti-cancer efficacy. I read these because these are buzzwords that we will get to as, thing, as, as topics come up throughout the, uh, the lecture period. Silicate esters of paclitaxel and its uh, sister molecule docetaxel. Synthesis, hydrophobicity, hydrolytic stability, cytotoxicity, and prodrug potential in a JMED Chem article and flash nanoprecipitation, particle structure and stability. So you're hearing those things over and over again. Some of this led to, uh, to, to protection of the IP uh, there because of the novelty of the silicate prodrugs, which I'll be uh, defining for you momentarily. Let's back up a little bit. Paclitaxel, the history of it. It's a natural product, a beautiful structure from the organic chemist's perspective, a complex one to be sure. It was discovered in 1964, found in the bark, uniquely in nature, in the bark of the Pacific yew tree, which is a very slow-growing tree. And if you strip the bark, it dies. So while it provided the first lead compounds and the exciting biology associated with it, there was very little to work with. And it took a very long period to allow this to, to provide, to allow chemists to find means of access. They do so now by taking green needles, renewable needles from a related species, isolating a compound that's similar to this, a late stage biosynthetic intermediate, and then doing several uh, synthetic chemistry steps to finish the job of providing the paclitaxel that now drives its use, its use in uh, first, first of all clinical trials and now as a, a very common and, and powerful um, uh, and important uh, chemotherapeutic, one of the most widely used in fact. It is formulated because of the problems associated with this, namely it's not very water soluble. It's a hydro, highly hydrophobic molecule in the scheme of things. It took a long while to figure out how to formulate it and that led also to a long, time, long term of development period. To come up with the formulation found in Taxol, which is the actual drug, and this gives you a sense of it. In Taxol, in that solution that you just saw, it's only 1.1% of the weight is, is the active ingredient. The, uh, the, 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 PTX, paclitaxel, is the active component. All the rest is about equal amounts of a surfactant called cremophore, EL, and ethanol, that's just a solution in which there is a suspension of, of uh, it's a microemulsion, if you will, of material that allows one to deliver this hydrophobic compound. And we heard some of that in the first lecture of the, this morning. Some, some of those same issues come up. But the cremophore, a lot of it, 26 milliliters in each dose that a cancer patient takes each time, often causes hypersensitivity, neurotoxicity, and affects di distribution and clearance. So it's not an ideal formulation. It's the best that was early on available uh, for this paclitaxel. That's evolved some. There's still uh, interest in developing better methods for delivery. Um, Abraxane is a formulation in which, um, instead of uh, uh, cremophore, human serum albumin, or HSA, is used to, uh, to, to uh, provide a stabilized uh, formulation, and it's now about 10 weight percent. This was approved, as you see, a little over a decade ago. 10 weight percent paclitaxel now in the Abraxane formulation, and it avoids some of the problems, a number of the problems with, uh, with cremophore. And most recently is Genexol, approved in 2007 for sale in Korea, and I'm still trying to find out if this is an approved drug. It's certainly been through many clinical trials here in the U.S. Whether or not it's still approved by the FDA, I should dig a little deeper. I don't, I'm afraid I don't have that answer. They're up to 17 weight percent paclitaxel now in PEG PLA micelles, very similar to the polymers that we're, uh, that we're working with. Nonetheless, can we develop a new improved formulation in which the weight percent is, is yet substantially higher? And that's what attracted us to this flash nanoprecipitation, which I'm about to, to share with you. And also along the way, could we come up with something that showed greater specificity and along with that some efficacy? That is less toxicity if you could deliver uh, the drug agent uh, selectively to, uh, to tumor sites. Flash nanoprecipitation is not something we invented by any means. It comes from the laboratory of Bob Prudhomme in the chemical engineering department at Princeton. 
initially pioneered or invented in, in, uh, reported in 2003. Here's a relatively recent. He continues to contribute in, in significant ways to that area uh, ever since. Here's a recent review on the topic, if you, uh, if you like. Uh, what do we do here? We take a mixing chamber, more about that in a moment, a very small volume, only 25 microliters, where one can impinge two solutions, an organic uh, solvent that is water miscible. You impinge them rapidly so that there's um, um, uh, dynamic mixing in this chamber. And it's only there, the lifetime inside the chamber is there for only a short period of time before it drops into bulk water for collection as one rapidly flows the liquids, the two liquids, against one another in this so-called impingement mixing technique. What's dissolved in the THF is the block copolymer that will be a protectant, as we will see, and an organic solute, something that's soluble in THF, but neither of these really like water. So you get to the point where neither one of them wants to be in solution any longer, and they find ways of aggregating. And I should remember to point out here at the outset, what comes out are kinetically trapped states of the, the, the samples, not thermodynamic micelles. Kinetically trapped states, though, in which one can load high, high loads of the organic solute. Chris McCosco primarily, but we were involved some, along with Jing Han in his laboratory, developed a simpler device, a very simple device, instead of having pumps and controlled speeds and so on. This is something that anybody can have made in a shop in a, in a, in a short period of time. Using two simple hand-driven uh, syringes, one can impinge in this little mixing chamber right here, and then finally out the exit tube down into the collection water. One can impinge this, and it doesn't much matter how fast the control, you can, you can push it down in uh, one second, you can push it down in a tenth of a second. As long as you're above a certain Reynolds number of mixing, which is easy to do, the turbulent mixing that goes on there uh, leads to uh, the uh, reproducible uh, part particle sizes, for example, that come out the, uh, the other end. And you can and you'd update this early view. I think, I think it's now been published in 2012. Um, here's a drawing, for example, that comes there if you're interested in this, in this kind of thing to be able to implement this technique. So here's a dummy drug that we started working with originally, beta-carotene, a hydrophobe, of course, not water-soluble to any extent for all practical purposes. The, the block copolymer is an amphiphilic polymer with polyethylene glycol, or PEG, that's that abbreviation I should have mentioned earlier. This likes water, although this block polymer is still soluble in the tetrahydrofuran. And we can use other water miscible solvents, such as DMSO or ethanol or acetone, if you like. And a polyester, PGLA, is, is a, a polyester PLG, I guess we call it, polylactic acid, polyglycolic acid, the ester, is hydrophobic. It doesn't like to be in water, so it wants to go into the core of the, of the material. So the advantages of this are it allows water-insoluble drugs to be administered in saline, uh, in, in, in aqueous suspension. You get high encapsulation efficiencies. I forgot to mention it. We were able to make stable particles with carotene up to 80 weight percent of the nanoparticle, of the, of the part of particle material. So you can get high drug loading. It's easily scalable. There's no reason you couldn't go into production with this if you needed to. The size regime of the particles that come out, these stabilized kinetic particles, are within the range that is desirable for the so-called EPR effect. Many of you will know that or have heard of it. I'll describe it ever so briefly in a moment. That is, 50 to 150 nanometers uh, sizes are, are often seen, whether we do microscopy or whether we do dynamic light scattering measurements of the materials. So here's a schematic of the enhanced permeation and retention effect. Tumors grow uh, at the, uh, the a limiting factor in their growth often is the ability to lay down new vascularization. So they're often in a region of our body where the vascular, where the vascular, the, the, the arteries and capillaries are just, uh, just being developed and they're said to be leaky at that stage. There are holes between them until they become fully formed. On the other hand, in, in existing healthy tissue, there's tight junctions between these, and uh, one can pass uh, through the membrane. Small molecules can find a way to go both directions. But larger entities in this vicinity of 50 to 150 nanometers, for example, can find their way through the leaky vasculature uh, selectively to invade the tumor vicinity in regions of the, of the body, but not so easily into normal healthy tissue. And that's one of the things one likes to take advantage of in, in one important approach uh, to nanomedicine. And, and perhaps that's been mentioned earlier today. 
The block copolymer, a little bit more about that, uh, that goes into this to mix with the Packlet's axle is this MPEG, that just stands for methoxy on one end of the polyethylene glycol, PLGA. Let me just mention briefly how one generates those. This is PEG with an OH on one end, a reactive hydroxyl group, and the other end capped off. These are uh, readily available in a variety of different molecular weight sizes. Under certain conditions, one can do what's called a ring opening polymerization, or ROP. Ring opening polymerization of a cyclic ester, those are known as lactones. In fact, because there are two of them here, these are actually dialides. The one with two methyl groups is called lactide. It's a dimer of lactic acid. The one that's completely unsubstituted is called glycolide, trivially. It's a dimer of glycolic acid, or just hydroxyacetic acid. If one mixes equal amounts of these with the intent of wanting to make a 50-50 uh, copolymer, you find you get very non-statistical distribution of the two different units within the polymer that you make because glycolide reacts much faster than the lactide. You'll all remember learning about steric hindrance in organic chemistry, and I'm here to tell you and remind you that steric hindrance is real. These methyl groups make quite a difference in the rates of reaction with which each alcohol of the growing chain attacks the carbonyl group of the monomer uh, compound. We tend to catalyze these with an amine base. It's called DBU. It's a mouthful. Let's not worry about it. It's an amidine base. It promotes the reaction rapidly. In one hour, you can consume lactide and make now PEG PLA, just a homopolymer of lactic acid. And we also are doing work with that class of polymers as well. The distinctions between the, the polylactic and the co-lactic glycolic are relatively small. We can get away with, with either of them in principle. However, because of this difference in um, reactivity, we found that we could compensate for that difference. The rate, the rate ratio, I thought I had it on here somewhere. Maybe it's on a later, later slide. It's about 1,000 times faster. Glycolide reacts about 1,000 times faster than lactide. So you can compensate for that by adding this slowly so that you always have a large excess at any moment in time of the lactide and infuse in slowly uh, the glycolide in order to compensate for the difference in reaction rates. Because our rate is a rate constant times a concentration. So the amounts of the two components that are, that are uh, competing with one another also matter in addition to their inherent uh, relative rate of reaction. So by doing this so-called semi-batch polymerization, we're able to now get more statistical distribution of the two different components in the final compound. Yeah, there it was. The homopolymerization rates are about 1,000 to 1 favoring the glycolide. So we did a series of experiments. I say continuous addition here by a syringe pump. You can also do it quasi-batch-wise. You know, if you, if you break an area down under a curve into smaller and smaller increments, you, you eventually do calculus, and you're doing it continuously. But practically in the lab, we may add uh, a quarter, and then a quarter, and then a quarter at varying uh, longer lengths of time. But you get the point. We can compensate for that along the way in doing the polymerization. So we can end up with close to a 50-50 mixture, which we, um, uh, which we can analyze by NMR spectroscopy again uh, to, to uh, convince ourselves of that. This is a, an index of the, uh, of the dispersity of the material, the polydispersity index. If, it's, if it were a single length molecule in, in every molecule, the same length in the sample, that PDI would be 1.0. Uh, 1.09 is awfully narrow. It's a narrow uh, dispersed uh, material uh, made by this kind of methodology. So what about the PTX loaded nanoparticle? Why not just take this kind of a, a block polymer and, and encapsulate and protect paclitaxel itself? And certainly those studies were done. Prudhomme did them early on in his laboratory. We looked at them uh, with, with uh, any of the some of the polymers that we've worked with as well. Use the FNP material. Uh, seems like you have success initially. You get something that looks just like um, the, the uh, uh, many other organics that you could add. However, in less than two hours, you see a dramatic change. There's a phenomenon called Ostwald ripening in which the contents of any nanoparticle, if they leave it one molecule at a time, can find partners on the outside and change the morphology of the particle itself and the composition and makeup of where the molecules find themselves. In the case of pure PTX itself, this nanoparticle stability is poor because in a short period of time, it's obvious that crystals grow on the outside, and those crystals, when you analyze them, are essentially pure, 
PTX paclitaxel. So ironically, even though this is a very hydrophobic drug, too hydrophobic to be uh, delivered in the usual kinds of ways, it still wants to leave these, uh, the core of these particles and go out into the water more rapidly than, than is, uh, would be required if this were to ever be an actual drug formulation. So what about a more hydrophobic prodrug? This almost sounds like an anathema to anyone who knows paclitaxel, uh, 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 medicinal chemistry. Why would you want to make it more hydrophobic? It's already too hydrophobic. Well, so it would stay longer inside the core of our molecules. By the way, we might also want to make it acid labile so that it would come off selectively. I forgot to point this out. The tumor environment generally has a pH that's roughly one pH unit lower, more acidic, than that in normal tissue. So it's another mode potentially to get some selectivity for this. So what do I mean by a silicate ester? Well, if one takes any molecule in principle, let's call it a parent drug, that has a hydroxyl group in it, or if I have time, I'll mention that one can do this with various NH functionalities as well, but let's just stick to hydroxyl for now. If you react it with a trialkoxy chlorosilane, it should be possible, we felt, because we're organic chemists, to make a silicate. A silicate is a tetraalkoxy, if this is an alcohol, this would be a tetraalkoxy, although a mixed one, silicate uh, with four different alkoxy groups on the silicon. Those are known to be acid labile. They're susceptible to hydrolysis rather quickly, but it depends on the nature of the R group. If this would hydrolyze with the right rate in the right environment, in the tumor environment, for example, one should be able to get back the parent drug, which would complete the prodrug concept. This is a prodrug because it's a, it's a precursor to a drug. It's not the actual drug. It would release two innocuous alcohols, if we choose those appropriately, and there are many that are perfectly fine from a toxicity standpoint. And even the byproduct silicic acid, it turns out, is non-toxic. So we've, we've, we felt that this was a perfectly fine construct to think about using in a medical application eventually. And the silicate prodrug nanoparticle idea is something that we've, we've captured in a now issued uh, patent. So how do you do this? You go to the laboratory and you take paclitaxel, you recognize that it has two reactive hydroxyl groups, and you know from looking at the literature that one of those is significantly more reactive, at least a factor of 10, more reactive than the other because of their environment and proximity uh, to other things in those molecules, steric hindrance differences being among them. If you react it with a chlorotriethoxysilane, small alkoxy groups, if you use excess in terms of molar equivalence, you can put a siloxy on both of those positions, for example. And we can chromatograph, purify, and prove the identity of molecules like that because we're organic chemists. And we know NMR spectroscopy, and we can analyze that in detail. So what about the hydrophobicity? One index for that is called a C log P. It's a calculated number. It's an estimate of the hydrophobicity. What is P? It's the octanol water partition coefficient. So if you take any substance and shake it in equal volumes of octanol and water, you'll come up with the ratio of that substance in those two different environments, water and the octanol. One octanol, it turns out. Well, this is a log scale. And if the, if the log gets larger, then there's even less in the water is the way this works out. Maybe you can see that math. Paclitaxel itself is 3.2, and I will tell you that most drugs are between negative 1 and 2. Negative 1 and 1.5 and uh, is the C log P value. Uh, this is calculated, but one can do it experimentally as well. We haven't for these compounds. But you can get an idea of the relative hydrophobicity as we put on ethoxies, octaloxies, C8 side chains, isopropyls. We can put some on just the two pos prime position. We can put some on just the seven prime position. And we can put some on both. This is just a smattering or a sampling of maybe uh, 18 or 20 or so other uh, prodrugs that we have made and evaluated. Incidentally, this correlates reasonably well with another technique one can use for estimating hydrophobicity. And that's the re relative retention time on a C18 reverse phase column for example. So we can dial in uh, over what? Oh, greater than four orders of magnitude difference in the hydrophobicity, at least measured by this particular index. 
What about the rates of hydrolysis, of the removal of the silicate? Well, we can go into the laboratory and come up with a model system for doing that as well, which we have done. This bulky one, these are tertiary butoxy and 1-ethoxy on the silicate on the 2' prime position. Of the ones I show here, so I benchmarked it to it, it has the slowest rate. These are relative rate constants. So we can dial in the rate of hydrolysis to release the free hydroxyl, the free drug, for uh, things present on that position or in the 7, uh, the seven position. Uh, and I won't go in and dwell on it uh, further. But here you see, again, an order of uh, more than three orders of magnitude difference in the rates of the hydrolysis. That is all by changing the nature of the R groups that are in these silicon derivatives, silicate derivatives. Uh, we can change both the hydrophobicity and the hydrolysis rate. We also did cell culture evaluation uh, of this and many others. So some of these prodrugs have very similar uh, IC50s, the ability to inhibit the inhibitory concentration for cell proliferation. We're looking at cell growth here. Uh, quite similar to paclitaxel itself. Now, whether or not that's the prodrug showing activity itself or whether in every case it's being hydrolyzed, we don't know for sure. We didn't analyze it that closely, although I note that this very bulkiest of the silo groups that are on here uh, had the, 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 the least uh, ability, uh, the poorest ability to inhibit the, the, the tumor cell growth. Again, all in cell culture in vitro. Flash nanoprecipitation. Now what happens when we try to connect to uh, incorporate the, um, uh, the uh, in this case, the bisethoxy, but we've done these kinds of experiments with, with those dozens of, uh, dozen and a half of other derivatives as well. We incorporate, we get a final dispersion that's stable indefinitely. Uh, indefinitely. For four days, we don't see much change in the uh, DLS measurements, in the growth in the aggregation size. We don't see any obvious uh, uh, loss from the core of the material and when we put it into pure water. And we can get easily up to 50% loading uh, of the small molecule, the silicate, inside the core of these materials. And I'll tell you something about how we analyze those, give you a sense for that in a moment. We can analyze or, or characterize these particles by cryo-TEM, low temperature frozen glass, vitreous, vitrified glass in which the particles reside. Here's a wide, uh, wide scale uh, view of the world, 200 nanometers, so you can count particles and do particle size distribution if you like. You can focus in a little closer and you see this fundamental core shell type of structure. They're not highly and perfectly organized, but they're by no means random. There's a much higher density of the drug material in the middle and of the polymer on the outside. And there's this fuzzy uh, a peg corona, sometimes it's called. The peg, which doesn't mind being in water, is on the very exterior here. And it is uh, 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 interspersed with water that surrounds the particles uh, that, are, that are being prepared. That's our, our best view of things. What about release of the, uh, of the silicate release versus hydrolysis rates? That is, the PTX regeneration there, there are several different ways to get paclitaxel back at the end. Paclitaxel is the blue. Either the hydrolysis could occur inside the particle and then the paclitaxel leaves. That's probably not very likely because this is hydrophobic. Water isn't going to be, uh, there, the concentration of water will be low in here. And more importantly, perhaps the environment, the, the, the uh, uh, the solvation, if you will, doesn't promote the, the ionic type mechanisms required for the simple hydrolysis of, uh, of a silicate, we would suspect. The other extreme would be for the silicate to come out and then for all of the hydrolysis to occur outside the, the, um, uh, outside the particle. And there could be a combination of both. And I can tell you, this is a very hard thing to prove. And we don't have definitive answers to that. At some level, we don't need to know if it's coming out ultimately to release paclitaxel at an appropriate rate. And so we can study slow release behavior, uh, sorry, uh, the release behavior of, of paclitaxel uh, as well as, I'm not sure, release of total taxanes. That's the paclitaxel and the prodrug measured by um, HPLC. It's very common in this kind of work to see a phenomenon known as burst release. Initially, you get quite a significant burst and then a different mechanism for release of the, of the contents of your nanoparticle after that. And that's undesirable from a therapeutic standpoint. And so we turn to centrifugation as one way of trying to then purify those, uh, those initial suspensions. If you centrifuge, um, resuspend, 
decant off the top, resuspend, and repeat that several times. You can get rid of other small molecules that are adhered, uh, portions of small molecules that are adhered to the external sides of the particles. We lyophilize to a dry powder and then do this same kind of analysis, and we see uh, release curves that now look much smoother, as if it's a more smooth release. This happens to be for that bis-siloxy compound. Oh, sorry, the, the blue is for uncentrifuged. The red is the same component once it's been centrifuged. And if we go to something that's a little slower to release from the uh, core, the octal oxy, it has a hydro higher hydrophobicity, we slow down the rate of release even further. So we have some control, both in terms of the hydrolysis rates and the hydrophobicity, in how quickly the paclitaxel is re-released to the outside world. And this is just a different view. I don't think I'll dwell on this. We can do HPLC analysis. Here's the paclitaxel that's being released. Here's the paclitaxel that remains, in, that remains inside the, the, uh, uh, the, the dialysis cassette is the way we're doing this measurement. The particles don't pass through the membrane. So we presume that anything that stays on the inside is still in the nanoparticle. Things that appear on the outside uh, necessarily have had to go through the membrane and they're only the small molecules. Um, given the time, I don't think I'm going to dwell on this as, uh, as well. Uh, we can get uh, high load levels, the equivalent weight of the PTX, so the silicates were even a higher mass percent. I'll just emphasize that we can load these to very high loading. Again, one of the hallmarks and one of the advantages that the flash nanoprecipitation provides. NMR spectroscopy, we can use to monitor things. Here are the various components that go into it. This is PTX before and PTX after the silicate derivatization. And we know how to interpret those resonances and what they all mean. Here's what the polymer looks like. And you can take then uh, loaded nanoparticles, redissolve them in chloroform, because even though they, um, uh, they're suspensions in water, if you lyophilize and have only the organic material present, it will fully dissolve in chloroform and you can reanalyze things after the fact. So what about efficacy in animals? Let me say just a brief word or two about that. Uh, we have not done extensive animal studies. The most efficacious was when we uh, did intratumoral, that is delivery directly into the tumor. And so that's kind of cheating in a way, but that shows the most prolonged effect so far. I won't go through the regimens that, that were involved here. I'm not the expert here. Certainly these, these studies were done uh, under the guidance of Jayant Panyan. Uh, and you can see, however, that we are able to get over fairly long periods of time, we're able to get arresting of the, of the rate of the rate of tumor growth as measured either by traditional caliber measurements or <clears throat> by using some luminescence techniques that I also won't bother to, uh, to go into in the interest of the time. We've also done direct uh, entail ve uh, venous uh, uh, introduction or injection of the material using cremophore, um, that is taxol preparations. One often sees this necrosis kind of activity, that is a dying of the, uh, of, of the, uh, of the uh, cell, cellular makeup and, and tissue makeup of the tail itself, whereas the, the compounds that we inject in the, uh, in the absence of cremophore uh, don't show this effect. And remember, we have this very high, high loading uh, efficiency. So toxicity indications from the in vivo studies, let me just highlight on this one, these necrotic characteristics uh, of, the, uh, of the cremophore uh, were absent in the nanoparticle treated uh, animals. So current studies, let me just finish by bringing you up to date on, uh, on where we are now. So there's a reincarnation of this now with uh, these players, if you will, and a new group of, uh, of, of uh, workers in the laboratory who are carrying out the experimental, uh, guiding the experimental work. The funding here has come from a new R01 grant, which has allowed Jayant and I, uh, we're the co-PIs on this, to reinvigorate our efforts, which otherwise had lain dormant for a, a couple of years before initiating this. I'll just read you the title here, Cancer Stem Cell Targeted. So we certainly have targeting now in mind. Silicate prodrug nanoparticles to combat recurrence. Uh, stem cells are, are an attractive target. So Jayant, uh, the cancer biologist here, teaches me, um, are an attractive target in that regard. So selective targeting of tumor cells by design and synthesis of PEG-PLG block copolymers containing ligands that are selective for cell surface receptors. That is, we can covalently attach ligands to the exterior of our tumor cells is the idea. I'm not going to be very specific here. I will tell you that we now know how to make, this is a, a formulation made from a block copolymer that, uh, that uh, Vijay uh, Gopalan has made. Uh, in which he's incorporated a dummy silicate, not yet a paclitaxel. This is tetramenthal silicate. Each of those alcohols is menthol. 
We can see the loading of the menthol. I've kind of color-coded some portions. Of, oh, I guess I didn't. These isopropyls, for example, are associated with the menthol. These are associated with the menthol. The uh, ones in green are associated with the um, uh, PLA, the polylactic acid. The ones, uh, the, the backbone here is the polyethylene glycol. And we even pay attention to some of the little peaks here that are meaningful to us. We've put malayamid on the terminus. And if you know conjugation chemistry, you may be uh, able to imagine some of the things we have in mind doing with those malayamid tips that presumably were on the outside of the particle. This is now dissolved back in deuterochloroform to analyze what is present then uh, after the fact. So. Um, I think I can show you uh, these silicates can be made from other functionalities than just other molecules as well, other than just paclitaxel. Carboxylic acids can be protected. Phos uh, next slide. Uh, where is it? I thought I had it on here. Uh, phenols, can be, phenols can be protected. Hydroxyls, carboxylic acids, as I said. Uh, there's tenofovir, that's what I was thinking of. A phosphoric acid, a phosphonic acid, I guess, uh, can be derivatized if you use a bulky enough silicate. One can protect the nitrogen atom of uh, various amine functionalities, anti-cancer drugs, antibiotics, uh, um, uh, HIV uh, uh, adju adjuvants, um, and the like. So, conclusions. Hydrolytic lability and hydrophobicity of silicates make them excellent candidates as prodrugs as pac of paclitaxel. The FNP silicate approach uh, is attractive because of both high drug loading and the ability to control the rates of release on the basis of both the hydrophobicity and the hydrolyzability. FNP provides nanoparticles of promising size and is easily scalable if need be. Silicate prodrug loaded nanoparticles have demonstrated efficacy when administered at least intratumorally. And we're, of course, seeking uh, uh, to, to find out if we can do this now uh, through selective delivery. The silicate prodrug is potentially broad broadly applicable, as those last, um, those last couple of slides might give you some hint. So again, I've named the people. I think these are all the folks whose data I've shown here specifically uh, this afternoon. Above Prodrome has been very helpful as, a, as an external uh, informal advisor along the way as problems come up and we seek his uh, insight and counsel on certain things. And I didn't emphasize this. I should have early on. A funding stream that came from Early, our earliest efforts here from uh, opportunities here on campus through the Minnesota Futures Grant Program, for example, that as these things would hope, have evolved eventually and, and evolved into a couple of different NIH grants now in our, in our uh, 21 initially, and now the R01 that I mentioned uh, to, uh, to the Panyam Lab and, and mine. So with that, uh, thank you. I hope I didn't run over too much, but, uh, but thank you. Yeah, it's a good question. So the question is whether or not uh, this kind of approach would help one deal with drug resistance, which is a problem broadly speaking, and is also a problem with, with uh, cancer patients specifically with paclitaxel. And, and I think the answer is no. I don't see an obvious way in which this would help in that regard. Um, when we said recurrence, it's, it's the cancer stem cells that are the, the most resistant toward any cancer chemotherapy, as I understand it. I'm not an expert in this field. And I, as I understand it, too, there's controversy even in that question um, uh, about whether that's a, a viable target or not. I suppose it's whatever the focus of your grant is. Uh, I don't know. Um, but, but uh, no, the, the, to overcome, uh, to, to help with recurrence, it's, it's the regrowth of the, of the tumor in general if we don't do a good enough job of wiping out the cancer stem cells at the beginning. Yeah, that's the hope here, is that by higher, more selective delivery, we could dose um, more aggressively, perhaps, because the side effects would be significantly reduced. That's always the goal in, in uh, can cancer chemotherapy. Well, I, I think that core shell picture is, is, is almost too, too rigidifying. They're, they're soft particles to begin with. Um, Think of them, too, as leaky. Things can get out one at a time. I think the paclitaxel example is the best of that. I don't have it on the slide here, but my recollection is when, the, when we tried encapsulating paclitaxel and watch it then regrow on the outside, the particles, the rest of the particles still remain intact. They shrink somewhat, and that's monitor, monitorable by DLS then if you filter out those big particles and look at the dynamic light scattering size the measurements that you get, the particles are otherwise remaining intact. It's not that they're blowing apart. So I think think of them as something that, that block polymer sort of re, uh, stays there forever. 
Uh, and I should mention, incidentally, that PEG PLA and PEG PLGA are uh, FDA approved entities for use in this kind of application. So they don't present any problem in terms of, uh, of an eventual therapeutic that, uh, if, if it might go that far. Okay, very good. If there are other questions, let's thank our speaker again.